not having our opinion appreciated, people who don't believe the way we do, <laughs> even about the God that we all serve. You know, if we were better at this message, we wouldn't have 900 different denominations, all who think they're the only ones that are right. I think some of those walls are starting to come down and I hope and pray that in my lifetime I'll get to see them come all the way down because wow, what a force we could be in the earth if we could all just decide to love each other and stop criticizing people who don't think exactly the way we think. I have to tell you, when we get to heaven, there is not going to be a Baptist section, a Pentecostal section, a Lutheran section, a Catholic section, a Methodist section. So we, we've got all this life here to practice getting along. I heard a statement recently that I thought was really good. What we need to do is seek unity within diversity. Because you see, we're all different. You, you cannot have a good marriage if you can't unify around your differences. You have to learn how to disagree agreeably and actually appreciate the differences in other people. What a messed up world it would be if everybody was just like each one of us. Yeah, that means you too. <laughs> what kind of a messed up world would it be if everybody was just like you? Oh. Yeah, who? yeah. Hmm. <laughs> we all think things might go better, but actually it really wouldn't. The Apostle Paul prayed what's referred to as apostolic prayers. In Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians, and I love to study and read those prayers. Sometimes I will even pray them over the people who attend the meetings because I think they're just full of power. And one of those prayers is in Philippians 1, 9, and 10. And he said, and this I pray, that your love might abound still more and more in all knowledge and in all discernment. So he's saying, look, don't be satisfied where you're at. Love more. Gain more knowledge. Have deeper discernment. Keep growing, keep growing, keep growing, keep growing. We need to never think that we've arrived and we've learned everything that we need to learn. And he said, I pray that you might approve things that are excellent and that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. Isn't it interesting that he threw that in? It must be important. Paul could only say a certain amount of things in these prayers, and he said, oh, and by the way, I'm really praying for you that you can live without offense until the day that Christ comes. Psalm 119, 165, great peace have they who love your law. Nothing shall offend them or make them stumble. Nothing shall offend them or make them stumble. Now, you know, after hearing this message, you will, unless you're just totally ignoring me, which I don't think you are, you will be more careful about offense for the next couple weeks, two or three weeks. <laughs> but you know, there's certain things that I think you can put on your prayer list, and they're important enough that you can pray about them every day, or you can confess something about them every day, or you can chat with yourself about them every day. And one of the things that I like to do is just, just be able to say to the Lord when I go to bed at night, Lord, I'm happy to say that I can go to sleep tonight and I'm not mad at anybody. <laughs> Amen. And furthermore, I think if you want to be a really seriously committed Christian, you'll lay aside your emotions of what you think and you'll be committed to not going to bed angry. Well, that went over like a lead balloon, didn't it? <laughs> We're always waiting for the other person to make it right. Can I just tell you a secret? Whoever makes it right first is the most spiritual. Yes. <laughs> just go ahead and be first.
It's good to just say in the morning, today I choose to not be offended no matter what happens today, especially if you know that that's a weakness for you or if you're going to be around somebody that tends to bug you or if you work in a place where it's easy to be offended, rude people, inconsiderate people, you're not really treated the way you should be treated. Make a decision. I am not going to go to work today and be offended. I don't care what happens. God, keep me strong so I don't spend my day offended. There's a lot of different kinds of offense. Taking offense, giving offense, being offended by the truth. Jesus offended people all the time just by telling them the truth. We can be offended at God or offended by trouble, which is one of the messages that I'm going to do this weekend. There's nothing worse, boy, than being just a little bit, tiny bit miffed at God because things didn't turn out the way you thought they should <laughs> or because you had a little rougher life. We can offend the Holy Spirit, and boy, that's something that should really bother us, not to want to offend the Holy Spirit. My, you say, well, how do you offend the Holy Spirit? What do I do to do that? Well, go read Ephesians 4, 29, 30, and 31. Not right now, but you'll find out real quick. You know what offends him the most? Anger, resentment, strife, the kind of stuff we're talking about. And then it also says a lot about words, useless words, crude words, all kinds of just things that we say that hurt people. And we all know that a lot of times offense is caused by things said or even good things that are not said. Amen? And then offending yourself. We're going to talk about that. Interestingly enough, the Bible says there's going to be no offense in heaven. <laughs> None. Zero. So guess what? We got to get it fixed before we get there. <laughs> Reaper angels are going to remove every offense. Now, here's something that I haven't taught on a while, and I think it's very important. If we look at Matthew chapter 24, it's all signs of the end times. Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, diverse places, on and on and on. But there's some things that I don't think we pay enough attention to when we talk about signs of the end times. If there's a famine, somebody says, oh, that's a sign of end times. If there's an earthquake, yep, there you go, signs of end times. Jesus is coming soon. Well, you know, there's another big sign <laughs> of end times that we're not paying enough attention to. And here's what it says in verse 10 and then in verse 12. Sign of the end times. And many will be offended. <laughs> Come on, we got to tell you. And many will be offended. There are more offended people in the earth today than at any other time. And I have never seen a time when people are so angry and, and so tense and full of pressure. And I mean, it just doesn't take hardly anything to set people off. Let me tell you something. When you've got to have special classes for people with road rage, now that's just gotten pretty bad, I think. Amen. And don't they have something now about people that have rage over their cell phones? I don't know. It's like, give me a break. I mean, if the cell phone's going to steal your peace, then get the thing out of your house. <laughs> And then many will be offended and repelled and will begin to distrust and desert him whom they ought to trust and obey and they will stumble and fall away. All because of offense. <laughs> you can't grow spiritually with offense in your heart. You can't succeed with offense in your heart. Nothing will deter the growth of a church more than if there's strife among the leadership. It's a killer. You're not going to have anointed worship if the choir director or the worship leaders fighting with the members or if the two of the members are thinking, well, I should have had your job and I didn't get it. And, you know, they're... How many of you know about that in church? 
Listen, I used to, I used to think that was Sunday entertainment. <laughs> I didn't know any better. Nobody was telling me what I'm telling you here today. And back before God really got in the middle of me <laughs> and started turning me inside up and upside down and finally right side up, I hope. We'd go to church every Sunday and we'd go out to lunch with our friends and just gossip. Hey, Pastor this. Well, it's no wonder nothing was going on in the church. Now, you know, no pastor can keep every person in the congregation happy, but you need to work enough to keep the junk out of your staff. And if you know that there's somebody in the congregation that is causing strife, you need to confront them and talk to them. And to be honest, if they won't change, I would invite them to leave. Because people work too hard and the price is too high that you pay to do something like this to let some person who just is not going to be happy no matter what you do, try and ruin it. Amen? You need to work to keep strife out of your family. The Bible says where there's unity, <laughs> there's blessing and anointing. So many will be offended. We live in a very violent time when people are so stressed out, trying to do too many things. And then verse 12 says, and the love of the great body of people will grow cold. And that's talking about the body of Christ. These to me are sobering scriptures. And the love of the great body of people will grow cold because of the multiplied wickedness and lawlessness in the land. The devil loves nothing better than a stronghold of cold love built up in our hearts so we don't care about each other. We don't have compassion on each other. We think nothing of cutting somebody to pieces with our mouth. We're not meeting each other's needs. But we go to church. Every one of us are in ministry. You're in ministry when you go to your factory. You're in ministry when you go to your office. And listen, people are watching you. And it's not unlikely that they don't try to offend you on purpose just to see what you'll do. Well, I'm preaching good. <laughs> See, here's the thing. I want you to enjoy your life. I tell you, I'm, I'm so full of that. That's why we call our television program Enjoying Everyday Life. I don't think there's anything worse than for God to have to watch somebody be miserable after he sent his only son and paid the price that he paid for us to have a great life, and then all we can do is be miserable and hate each other and be mad. And... That, that's the great tragedy. The cross was a tragedy, but we continue the tragedy if we don't do have the life that Jesus died to give us. I love what Paul said in Let's see, what is that? Philippians 3. He said, one thing I do, one thing that's important, letting go of what lies behind and pressing toward the things that are ahead. Some of you need to let go of some things tonight. I mean, you need to leave them here. Don't take them home with you. Did you hear me? Don't take them back to work with you. Don't keep them anymore. Let them go. That's what forgiveness means, to leave it, to let it go. Walk away from it. Stop at a trash dump on, the, on your way home and just physically get out of your car and say, I'm putting this stuff in the trash where it belongs. I'm not taking it home with me. It may sound foolish to you, but sometimes it's good just to take some kind of physical action like that. I'm throwing this stuff away. I'm not keeping this. I'm getting rid of it. Leave it. Let it go. Letting go of what lies behind. You can't press toward the things that are ahead if you're trying to drag yesterday with you. Amen? Come on, Jesus died so you can have a life. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. <laughs> 
And listen to the rest of what Paul said. Come on, I want you to get this. I am determined to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus died to take hold of me. He's saying, I'm going to take hold of what Jesus died for me to have. I'm going for it. Come on, is there anybody here tonight that's going to say, I'm going for it? Let's don't do any more pathetic Christianity. I'm mad, you hurt my feelings. You know, and that doesn't mean that people don't misbehave. They do. You know something? We are in a war. We're soldiers in God's army, and there's a spiritual war that goes on around us actually all the time. And we always need to be refreshed to remember that we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. Amen. We'll look at a scripture sometime this weekend probably where Peter rebuked Jesus about saying that he was going to go to the cross and suffer. <laughs> and Jesus turned to him and said, get behind me, Satan. He looked straight at Peter and said, get behind me. Now, I don't recommend you do that at home. But <laughs> Ooh, I better straighten that out quick before you guys go home. <laughs> Ladies, don't go home and look at your husband and say, you're the devil. But I'm making a point here that he knew who was behind what Peter was doing. And he said, you are an offense and a hindrance, and you're trying to keep me from the will of God. What are you blaming on a person that's just the devil working through some inherent weakness that they have? And you'd be much better instead of spending the whole day or a year mad at them to use some of that time rebuking the devil and praying that God would strengthen them in that area of weakness. Remember, we're going to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus died to take hold of us. Many will be offended. The love of the great body of people will grow cold. Here's what I want you to know. Love is spiritual warfare. <laughs> when you walk in love every time you forgive somebody you've won a battle with the devil every time you're good to somebody that hurt you you just won a battle with the devil amen every time you give your offering is spiritual warfare Well, good, a few of you got that. It is. God doesn't need your money. You need to give, and I need to give. And I do it on purpose. I look for reasons to give. I do. I do it on purpose. I love what Job said. He said, the cause of him I did not know, I searched out. Job went out looking for poor people to help. He didn't wait for them to come to him. And he said, if I don't use my arm to help somebody, then he might as well just yank it off my body. I mean, there's some pretty... Powerful scriptures in the word if you really choose to believe them. We can't do this and not walk in love. Satan will have our hide. There's such a great life available to us. So many amazing things that God wants to use you for. But you can't carry God's anointing and be mad at somebody all the time. Just can't do it. I can't, I can't get up here and expect what I say to be anointed if I get up here mad at Dave. I can't do that. How many of you are making a decision tonight you're going to get rid of some of that offense? And... It's time to cut off all the hangnails. Amen? Love covers and forgives offenses. You know what? We have to learn to live in what I call a new normal. You say, well, it just 
You know, it's normal for people to get their feelings hurt when somebody's rude to them. Well, but you've got a new normal. <laughs> Your normal is not like an unsaved person's normal. And your new normal when you get out of here is not going to be what it was yesterday because now you know something about something that maybe you didn't know about before. So now you've got to include this and in all the stuff that you, that you know. Paul said this, for you are still unspiritual. Still unspiritual. These were spirit-filled, church-going people. And he said, you are unspiritual. <laughs> Because you have the nature of the flesh and you're under the control of ordinary impulses. Because as long as there is envy and jealousy and wranglings and factions among you, are you not unspiritual and of the flesh behaving yourself after a mere human standard and acting like mere unchanged men? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature who's given a new life and we have new power <laughs> and a new normal. And it's not normal for a Christian to be easily offended. Well, I pray that the teaching you've heard today from God's Word will motivate you to refuse offense and instead, on purpose, be a peacemaker. And to help you in this area we're offering you today, understanding your triggers and avoiding the trap of offense. It's a four CD audio series and also a book called Worry Free Living. Now let me just tell you again that one of the most important things in my life has been to learn how to live strife free. And strife comes when we are offended. There's so many little things that people become offended about. And I feel that this is a very, very important subject for you to study and study and study until you realize that you can't just wait for all your circumstances to change in life. You have to be the one who's willing to change. And so there's a lot of information in this, these CDs and this book that you don't want to miss because, to be honest, there's a lot of things in your life as far as the quality of how your life is going to turn out that are dependent on you learning how to really live in peace. So thank you for being with us today, and I pray that you would have an absolutely marvelous, wonderful rest of the day. Have you forgotten what it's like to live in peace? You don't have to any longer. Joyce shares how to trust God and receive his peace in her book, Worry-Free Living. And to help you explore root causes that may hinder you from living a peaceful life, we're including Joyce's four-part CD series on understanding your triggers and avoiding the trap of offense. Don't waste another day worrying. Make it your goal to start walking in God's peace today. This combo package that includes both Joyce's book, Worry-Free Living, and her four-part audio series, Understanding Your Triggers and Avoiding the Trap of Offense, is yours for a donation of $30 or more. Call our toll-free number, 1-800-727-9673 or visit us at JoyceMeyer.org. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Good to meet you, guys. What's your name? Jim. Jim. Good to meet all these guys. God's greatest gifts. Awesome. You're welcome. And you get the Battlefield of the Mind book, which is. Thank you. It's all join hands. Lord God, we just love you. We thank you so much. Today is the big milestone. We've, we've reached that three millionth package, you know, of one of Joyce's books going in and, and being able to hand that out. Man, it just is incredible in the number of lives that have been touched through the years by what we do as a prison outreach. My mind has to go back through the years, you know, at different places we've been and, and, you know, the people that have been reached, the people that have been helped, the letters that have come in, the, the you know, the testimonies that have been given from all the inmates and, and how it has really and truly affected their lives and their lives um, transformed, some of them totally, completely. They're, they're different people. They're not the same anymore. 
and to know that we had a part in that, what a blessing. I'd say a great big thank you because without our partners, you know, our partners are what makes everything possible in their ministry. Without our partners, we couldn't do what we're doing. And so the effect that we're having here in prison and throughout the world is a result of our faithful partners who have, and many of them have been faithful for a long, long period of time. Well, I'm here in Sri Lanka and with me are some medical professionals that have volunteered their time to come here and help hurting people. And if you're a medical professional, a doctor, a dentist, a nurse, pharmacist, a chiropractor, please consider volunteering to come and help people who otherwise wouldn't have any help. So what do you think? Is this a good thing to do? Yeah! <laughs> it's time, ladies, because this life is not a dress rehearsal, so we need to seize every opportunity God gives us. Join thousands at the 2016 Love Life Women's Conference don't miss the fun with Christine Kane. You go, girls. You did not give up. You did not stop. You continue to carry the baton of faith. Beth Moore. I'm redeemed by Jesus Christ. What does that mean to us besides everything? And Joyce Meyer. Why don't you stop looking at what